rising during this season. And that is that a spirit of fear and even torment has hit many, many lives and many, many hearts. And so I would like to address that today, knowing that God can and will help us overcome that, that we can walk through this season with faith, with anointing and with power. And, and not only that, we can walk out stronger than we have walked in. And so as you open your Bibles to Daniel, the first chapter, the third verse, um, I'm going to preach to you on this thought. I know the thoughts that I think. I know the thoughts that I think. We find our reading um, for the foundation of it. We find that as Daniel begins to write, that historically Israel has been taken into bondage and carted off to a kingdom very different and very strange from their own. They have endured three attacks on Jerusalem. And so the reader quick and quickly um, understand that King Nebuchadnezzar is tempting and, and changing the thought process and ideologies and belief system of the people of God. And Daniel begins to pin these words and of what the king has done. And the king spake to Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom there was no blemish, um, uh, uh, um, well favored, skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding of science and such as had an ability um, in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years. And at the end thereof, they might stand before the king. Now, before you begin to simply say that um, it, the reason why Daniel um, neglected eating at the king's table was because that um, he was not eating food offered to idols. But we know historically that more than just the king's meat and the wine was offered to idols. In fact, some historians say that everything that the king had eaten had been laid upon the altar. Rather, it was Daniel continuing to have a distance, uh, continuing to continue, if you will, in holiness, to, to understand that I will not form to the ideologies and begin to worship and begin to bow to the gods of Babylon. And so we find <coughs> that Daniel and his friends Easily, I believe we could we could possibly say that they were gripped with fear. Historically, they say that Daniel and his friends were somewhere between the ages of 13 and 15 years old. And so if this is the case, then they must have been gripped with an absolute fear. They had to endure the pressure. The peer pressure of the moment. They had to endure the fear to understand that there are no longer parental guidelines or priestly guidelines in which they could lean upon and they could look to and they could talk to. And, and so it is when the people of God I, I, I'm attempted to come uh, with the grips uh, of, of their plight now in life. And, and so with all that, with Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach Abednego standing there and saying, I will not eat of the king's provision. I, I will continue to only eat things that are kosher. If I have to eat to be a salad man, then, then so be it. Uh, but I have made up in my mind uh, that I will not allow my thoughts uh, to be twisted, uh, my thoughts to be changed, uh, the way that I view God and the way that I view my life to be changed uh, by what is going on in society and in the midst of this in the in the midst of what is going on and as Daniel is walking the halls of, of the palace of King Nebuchadnezzar there is a prophet named Jeremiah writing uh, from um, the, the ruins of Jerusalem uh, and he begins to write this letter to the exiles in Babylon uh, in Jeremiah 29 11 I will read it in two different versions uh, he writes he said for I know the thoughts I think towards you saith the Lord 
thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. It could also be stated this way. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not harm to give you a future with hope. I believe every believer must have an understanding and approach life and the circumstances that we're in with the absolute understanding. Hey, wait a minute. God already has thoughts towards us. He already understands. He's already brought peace to us. And he's already given us an expected end. It is not God's plan for the church of the living God and the people filled with the Holy Ghost to languish in fear, but rather to walk by faith and understanding that God already knows the end from the beginning. And he's already prepared a plan and a path for you to be an overcomer and for you to walk out with faith. And so in trying times, it is the people of God that must learn to encourage themselves in the Lord. They must encourage themselves with the knowledge that he has already planned out and given us an expected outcome. We can find this uh, throughout the New Testament as the readers of 2 Timothy. They discover uh, a lonely Paul languishing in a Roman prison, uh, writing to his consort Timothy. Uh, he is not dealing with the fact uh, that he understands uh, that he has an impending death uh, right around the corner, but rather he leaves young Timothy with words of encouragement as he writes to him for God has not given you this given us the spirit of fear but a power and love and of a sound mind why this statement in time of fear and doubt because he's encouraging young Timothy not to allow fear to creep in and begin to to uh, um, to to bring and derail his life and his walk with God and his ministry but rather Paul is writing during a time of tribulation that when you are walking through some dark times that God has given you the power and love and a sound mind. He has given us courage, not a cowardly fear, but a courage that Christian service should bring. A, a service that always uh, um, causes the Christian to walk in courage. Courage that comes from a continual consciousness of the presence and the promises of God. He has given us power, true Christians. There should be a power to cope. A power to shoulder backbreaking task. A power to stand firm when faced uh, with shattering situations. A power to, uh, to retain faith when confronted by soul destroying sorrow and by wounding disappointment. Uh, Christians, Christians should characteristically be people who can pass what the world considers a breaking point and not break. Why? Because we have the power of God within our lives. And he also has given us love. In Timothy's case, it was a love for his brothers and sisters and for a congregation of the people of Christ whom he was set over. It was, it was that love, that love that, that, that helps us during these times, not to turn in in fear, but rather to turn out and begin to help people in, in, in similar situations. Not, not a power that calls us to try to, to, if you will, to circle the wagons and try to wait it out, but a power to pray and love and help those in times of trouble. But also he has given us Self-discipline, the worst they were there is so friend of friend ismos. As some writers say, it is un, an untranslatable Greek word. But they do their best to define it. And one, one writer defines it this way. It is the sanity of saintliness. He defines it as the ability to control oneself in face of panic or of extreme passion. Christ alone that keeps us from being swept away or running away during a time of trouble. And so no one can really help others until they have self-control within their lives. A self-control that is divinely given. 
a self-control which makes people great leaders and others to be powerful servants of an almighty God that starts with control of themselves. And so when life hurls both at society and the church, an absolute fear and an absolute torment, we must remember continually, as in, again in 2 Timothy, that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. What about my job? God has not given us the spirit of fear. What about disease, God? Has not given us the spirit of fear. What about the economy? God has not given us the spirit of fear. What about a world that seems to be deteriorating around us? God has not given us the spirit of fear. But I come to challenge the church. That in this time and in this season. It is time for the church to rise and be everything. That she should have been being all along. Because we must remember that there is power in prayer. There is power in worship. And there is power when the people of God unite together and pray and say, God, will you bring us out? And will you feel people with the Holy Ghost in the midst of chaos? In one of the churches I was just in, a young lady stands up and she begins to talk about everything that has been going on. She talked about the fact that she lost the job and God challenged her. And God told her, you, you say you trust me, but you really don't. And so she went 10 months, 10 months without ever working a job. She said, but in the midst of it all, the car was paid. The house was paid every single, she did not, not one bill was late. And in the midst of this mess, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of all the protests, in the midst of the absolute fear. God just gave her a job the other day that far surpasses the pay that she thought she was going to do. What, what am I trying to say that See, when you understand, it's not, it's not alone that, that, that we understand the thoughts God thinks towards us. But the question also is, what are the thoughts that you think towards God? And so if you're suffering fear, if you're suffering with torment, I have the answer. First John tells us this. For in 18, but there, there is no love. There's no fear in love. For perfect love casteth that all fear. Because fear hath torment. He, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And if, and if you are hearing this message in you, you begin to say, well, but, but I'm suffering with fear. I want to remind you of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so in the midst of fear, in the midst of torment, you can receive the peace. And the power of God. How, how, how can that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Because we can find it in Acts 2 and 37 through 39. Well, uh, Peter has preached on the day of Pentecost. And the Bible says this. And when they heard this, I'm reading a different translation than what is on the screen. But I, it, it, well, I'll, I'll read that one. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They are asking the question. I've recognized that I've sinned. I've recognized that I've done wrong. I recognize that I need God. What do I need to do? Maybe you're saying I'm living in fear right now. I'm living in torment and I feel like my world is falling apart. How can I get God to help me? Well, the best thing you can do is do what Peter said. You got to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and ye shall receive 
receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you can lift your hands right now and begin to ask God to forgive you of everything you've done wrong. And maybe you've never been baptized. You can cut you into new life. And I promise you, they will get together with you and either teach you a Bible study or walk you through the rest of repentance. And the greatest gift you can give yourself is allowing God to come in and fill your heart, your mind, your soul with the power of the Holy Ghost. And when you begin to speak with other tongues, you will feel the power of fear leave your life. Speaking of fear, what, what, what is fear? What is, what is fear? Well, fear can be defined as an emotional foreboding or dread of impending distress or misfortune. But sadly, sadly, most fears that we face are not a reality, but rather something that has been drummed up either, either right now by the media or sometimes just our own, our own faults. The concept of fear is referenced in the Bible several hundred times. Speaking of words such as this, uh, um, trembling, shaking, shuddering, and cringing along with the word fear. And so it is the job of the church. We must navigate carefully to understand and to, to work out the circumstance and walk wisely, but not in fear. And with all this going on, and when I'm not telling you that because you don't have fear, you should just not, not wash your hands. No, no, wash your hands. Be smart. In fact, wash your hands all the time, especially after you go to the bathroom or, or before you eat or after you someone snotted and shook their hands or you touch a basket or whatever it may be. No, no, no. I'm not saying that fear makes you act dumb. No, that's not what I'm saying. You, you must be wise. You must be healthy. And, and by the way, if you simply do what you're supposed to, you, you, won't, you won't have to worry quite a bit. But, but, but yet, but yet this, this absolute fear that has caused people to, to hide in their homes and, and to do things they never thought they would do. And, and so fear can be gripped so many lives. But Paul writes and gives a believer an answer. In the book of Ephesus, he says this, something like this, therefore, take all, take all Ephesians 6 and 13, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in an evil day, having done all to stand, stand. And so he writes to his readers and states that having overcome everything, you, you will be standing. It's not done through social media. It's not done through a self-help book. It's not done through, through our own understanding. But the only way that we can endure what is going on and still continue to stand. What enables us? He goes on to say in verse 14 that therefore you have to have your loins skirt about with truth. For many, we're going to read through this, for many for many, we're struggling to understand why so many things change and people are struggling to understand truth. But, but you must understand that the greatest truth of all is not whatever the news says, but rather to understand that God's word is truth. If you're going to make it through, if you're going to walk without fear, you cannot be girt up with whatever the world says. But you've got to remember what God, the promises that God has given to your life. And you've got to put on uh, that breastplate of righteousness uh, or being right with God uh, and you got to have your feet shod uh, with the preparation of the gospel of peace uh, where are you going to find peace uh, you're not going to find it in the world uh, but you are going to find peace uh, with a relationship uh, and an understanding that God loves you and will keep you and above all taking the shield of faith and he goes on to say take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But verse 18 is probably most important in driving this spirit of fear out. He says this, pray always with all supplication in the spirit. Watching therefore with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. How, how am I going to do this? Because see, I don't need the faith of human understanding, but rather 
I need to understand God's faithfulness to his people. And so Paul, Paul shows us the greatest weapon in our arsenal. And that is prayer. We know three things quickly about prayer. Prayer must be consistent. It is our tendency only to pray during great crisis in our life. But it is a daily prayer of the saints of God where we will find our daily strength. Prayer must always be intense. And it must be focused. Unfocused prayer never got anyone anywhere. So, so we got to pray with an understanding, God, this is where the need is at. And also, and also prayer, especially during this time, it must be unselfish. And so we must bind with the people of God. We must look at what is going on in our situation. We, we must see during these perilous times and let our prayers be focused and saying, God, will you help our nation and will you help the world come out? But God, in the midst of it all, will you bring our greatest revival? Paul, Paul inscribes to the believers in Corinth. He said this, he said, for we walk in the flesh, but we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He goes on to say, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Uh, quickly, I will say this, uh, that most of uh, the battles we face uh, are not within the world, uh, but rather they are within our mind. Uh, that's why the writer says this, uh, our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Uh, I believe there he begins to describe them. They're the imaginations uh, that we bring into our mind. Uh, it is a thing uh, that we exalt itself against the knowledge of God. That thing that says, I'm going to believe everything else in the world, but I will not believe that my God is a healer and my God is a keeper. But notice Paul also says, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so, and so the, the strongholds are in our lives. It's a self-speak. What we say to ourselves, it's an inner monologue that so many times people allow run free. And so if we are to win the battle, we will only do it when we grab the imaginations. That fearful thing that we are speaking to ourselves and bring them back into captivity and baptize them in prayer. And so what needs to be done will not be done. By attempting to intellectualize our situation. But it will only come when you reach out with faith in an almighty God. Now for rather. I'm not trying to dabble in anyone's business. But be careful how much you allow social media and even the news to overtake your life. There is what is called in. In my schooling right now, the cognitive triangle, it's so simply it's this. The thoughts that you think affect the emotions that you have. And the emotions will affect your behavior. Or it could be that your thoughts will respond in action. And action will then uh, uh, move to emotion. And so the only way you can stop your emotion from going crazy and from your actions from going nuts is to take control of your thoughts. That's why we must bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. Let, since, since, since you all know me very well and you all know I got a little sarcasm in me, that's why people will drive down the road all by themselves wearing a mask because they're so afraid of things going on. And so if you are going to get rid of fear, it must be done. At the thought level. Philippians 4, 8, 9 says this way. Finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, the writer says, think on these things. 
those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Uh, um, do, and the peace, and the God of peace shall be with you. So how you walk with God and the thoughts you think will bring the peace that passes all understanding. My, so my focus then will not be on the fear. My focus then will not be on the news. My focus, and I'm not saying don't just reject it and pretend like it's not happening. No, but, but when, see, when your focus is on God, I refuse to filter my tomorrow through the lens of fear, but rather I, re I, I choose to look at my tomorrow through the lens of faith. Dr. Stephen Stones, he says it this way. He's, he's, a, he's a psychologist. He, he writes on the effects that thoughts will have for those people around you. He writes this. He writes, we know the meaning of phrases like the mood of the nation or the feel of the community or can you sense the excitement in the air? These metaphors in themselves make no literal sense, but he says there is an understanding that we have that simply means this. Thanks to, to our intuitive awareness that we are picking up on the emotions of those around us and it becomes contagious to our lives. In fact, he writes that the principle of emotional contagion holds that the emotions of two or three people converging are passed to another person and from that person to even a larger group. He goes on to say, he said, we tend to think of them as purely internal phenomena, but emotions are more contagious than any virus and are transmitted subliminally to everyone within our proximity. This is not a Pentecostal preacher. This is a psychologist that writes this. And so fear of two or three people converging can be passed to someone else and can be passed to someone else. So what you listen to can cause fear to converge on you. It, it, it causes fear to come into your home. It causes fear to come into your prayer life. It causes fear to come into the church. But if fear can be an emotional contagion, then what about faith? Then what about peace? Then what about joy? What would happen to the church of the living God if they got on their faith and got anointed and let the peace of God begin to come into their life and they walk out of their community. They walk into their bank. They walk into the store. And the power of God is radiating in them. What could happen in your city if you walk by faith and not fear? It just so happened. It just so happened. Just recently, just recently, my wife was reminding me about when her mother was, was dealing with cancer. Now, she, before she would take her to the doctor, she would spend time in prayer saying, God, I know we're walking into a place that is fearful and many people have no hope. Will you please let the power of God and peace be felt as we walked in? And she said, she said, honey, I can't tell you how many times that we would walk in and people would be so, saying, we are so glad you're here because every time you walk in, we feel so peaceful and we feel joy. So it is even... Even in churches when they make up their mind, I will no longer live in fear. It happened. It happened just recently in a church. And I'm not saying because of me. I'm saying because the people understood. Hey, wait a minute. If I let the peace of God come in, it will change. And, and in one service, one service, one service, people that were so fearful suddenly begin to smile again and begin to love, love one another. See, because even another professor of mine said this. He said, the very thoughts we think affect those around us, even when they do not realize. So if your thoughts can have an effect on others, if your emotions can have an effect on others, then should it not be that the people of God, with the power of Almighty God reigning and ruling in their lives, should it, we not have an effect so powerful that it can begin to drive out fear from those around us? What would happen when fear 
we began to attempt to creep in that we would remember that we have this treasure, the power of God, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power of God, as excellency of power may be of God and not of us. As the writer continues, he says, we are troubled on every side, yet not in distress. We are perplexed, but not, um, but, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but not destroyed. What was the writer saying? Hey, wait a minute. When you've got the power of God, you can go through anything, uh, and it will not destroy you. I like the way the writer J.B. Phillips says, we are handicapped on all sides, uh, but we are never frustrated. Uh, we are puzzled, uh, but never in despair. Spare. We are persecuted, but never have to stand alone. I like this part. He said, we may be knocked down, but we are never knocked out. I've come to remind somebody in a time of fear and torment, you are not knocked out. In a time where the world is trying to encroach, even in the church, with fear, it's time for the power of the people of God to stand up and say, wait a minute, that I have an effect. In fact, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is my faith uh, that I will live for God than the fear that the world is trying to press into my life. And so, in these trying times, as Jeremiah said again, for I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. It's not enough to understand the thoughts God thinks towards us. It is also just as important to understand the thoughts we think towards him. Again, it's Paul in Romans. He's writing to a people he's never visited. He said this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril of the sword. Who's going to separate us from God's love? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He would later remind the believers this. He would say, be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world put you in its frame. Don't let the world force you to believe and act like everybody else. But be transformed. Again, how, how then? How then? How then? How can you be transformed? The only way is by the renewing of your mind. The word there is anachronosis. To means to renovation of the mind. In a time of fear, in a time of torment, in a time where we are asking questions and wondering how we're going to make another day. It's time to renew our mind. How? Renew it by prayer. If ever we should be a people of prayer, even more so today. It's to renew it by worshiping our way through things. It's remembering the thoughts that God has thought towards me, but also the thoughts I think towards him. It's, it's not allowing that fear to dwell not allowing that fear to gain purchase and a foothold. See, Hebrews tells us this, now faith is a substance of things so for The evidence of things not seen, it's, it's down it's down 32 verses. They write this, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness, was made strong. How then? What are your thoughts towards God? Have you spent the time to get alone with Him? 
Because see, faith will allow you to walk with God. Fear will hinder your prayers. It will hinder your worship. Not only that, it also will affect everybody around you. I know the thoughts I think towards you, said the Lord. But I've come to ask the question to remind us, we better make sure the thoughts we think towards him. And so in closing, as we are in our homes, I wonder, maybe you could close your eyes and lift your hands one more time. I'm going to close in a prayer, and I, I wonder, I just wonder, husband, wife, get together, bring the kids around, and say, from this day forward, we will no longer walk in fear. We are going to walk in faith. No longer will I let just whatever is being said just run rampant and gain purchase and, and build a stronghold in my mind. No, no, from this moment on, my, my thoughts are going to be directed towards an almighty God who has kept me, who has saved me, who has brought me out, who has healed my body, who has blessed me time and time again. Oh, come on, can you lift your voice within your home right now and begin to pray, God, I, I want to change my thoughts towards you. I, I want to to be a faith. I, I want it to be that I worship you. I want it that I walk around through my city not saying, look what's going on, but saying, God, will you touch each and every individual I come in contact with? Uh, can they feel the power of God? Uh, can they feel the anointing that is upon me? I want them to ask me, are you a Pentecostal? I want them to ask me, what church do you go to? I want them to feel when I walk by the peace uh, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I want the torment that they've been dealing with uh, to flee. Uh, God, I pray uh, that within my home uh, that there will be peace. Uh, I can lay my head in peace. Uh, I can rise up in peace. Uh, the tension within my home will vanish uh, and I will know that God reigns supreme. Come on, we're going to close right now. But continue, continue, can you continue to pray until you feel the peace of the Holy Ghost? Can you continue to pray until you feel the power of God? Come on, make sure every day this week that you spend some time in prayer and say, God, will you touch my church? Will you touch my community? Will you touch my job? Will you touch my nation? Will you touch our president, God? Help us to navigate this. But more than that, God, will you help the churches reopen? That we might have the harvest within the building that we have so long to have. Come on. Come on. As she begins to play, can you lift your hands right now and lift your voice and begin to love the wonderful name of Jesus. God bless you, new life. We will be praying for you. Come on. Let's have revival in the midst of all this.